Good morning. Good morning. Well, some of you were quite awake last night, listening to the thunder and the lightning. Now, I was not here. My wife told me, you know, I said, no, I just fell to sleep. I saw some of the light, but I slept right through it. We were talking this morning with Pastor Paul and we praying. And when he talked about the thunder and the storm, he said, thank the Lord for your creativity. And that struck me because that is so correct. Some people say that God showed his might and power in the storm. I don't think so. I think he would diminish his might and power. We talk about some static in the sky and some rubble of the earth. God is so much more powerful. All that to say this. Psalm 50. The mighty one. God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes, and he does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire. Around him a mighty tempest calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness. God himself is judge. I like the beginning. It says the mighty one God, the Lord, and that is the word for Yahweh Adonai. They could not pronounce the name Yahweh, the Almighty God, the Holy of Holy, but Adonai is a close curve, a Lord, a Lord that is kind and loves his people. And because of and through Jesus, our God, our Father. All of the storms and the earthquakes, they need nothing. He is so much more powerful and even more loving. And because of that love and grace, you are here today. And his people are drawn to him. And we call him Dad. Oh, our Heavenly Father, our Dad. This morning, we choose to bring our heart and mind to a resting place. We will not overthink, we will not fear, we will not plan, we will rest in the deep this morning. We look into your word and we will drink deep for your grace and love and truth. And we thank you, Father, that with you, there is no such thing as our truth, his truth, her truth. There is only one truth, Jesus Christ. For he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In him, we glorify your name. And we thank you for the love that you have poured into our hearts. And so this day, we surrender to you once again our lives our plans, we repent of our sin, and we call into our lives your rule, your might, your power, and your word. In the name of Jesus we pray.
as God's people, we don't want to react. We want to respond. Responding is something that indicates thought and actually thinking of. We don't want to be like the, the creation. The psalm we're saying here this morning says, uh, the earth has no voice, and I have no choice but to magnify God. I'm ashamed. Let the rocks speak up silent for one more day. Let the whole world sing out. Let the people sing. We are the ones that God has given the tremendous privilege and responsibility of proclaiming Him to the world. And we do that every time we come together on Sundays as a body, to sing together, to worship together, to study God's Word together. Let's stand this morning as we sing Almighty, Most Holy God.
so, Lord Jesus, we come with this prayer. <coughs> Father, we do say her now. Lord, we don't want that term to be to become trite. Lord, we do look forward to your future coming. And Lord, every day as we look at what's happening on the world stage, it's very easy to get uh, discouraged, depressed, or it's even easy to despair at times. And yet, Lord, we understand that you are the one calling the shot. Lord, you have your plan, your purposes, and it is your purposes that will prevail. And we praise you and we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that you have set aside a time each week when your people can come together, Lord, to, to worship you, to study your word, just to be in your presence. And Father, this morning, as we engage in that weekly event, and sometimes two or three times a week, Lord, as well with other believers, we pray, Father, that we would bring honor and glory to you what we do and what we say. Lord, as we speak about you, as we pray, as we're in your word, Father, just grant that all these things would be such that we would have you in our hearts and in our minds, Father. Lord, grant that we would be able to set aside all those concerns that might weigh upon our hearts and minds this morning, that we can focus just on you. Lord, we thank you for each one who's here this morning. Pray for your blessing on each one. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Just for practice, on the count of three, say hallelujah. One, two, three. Hallelujah! Okay, let's take it off. Let's continue to say this for Blessed be your name.
You can do that at 11 o'clock in the morning, whatever time it was when the rain is falling. I was telling Pastor, um, ordinarily I, I really enjoy listening to the rain when it's falling on the roof of our travel trailer. But there's a difference between rain falling on top of the travel trailer and her elephants on top of the travel trailer. <laughs> Last night that rain just boom, and the lightning it was just great. And that's a very worshipful time where you say, yeah, we're, I, this is amazing. You really are creating the moment. So this is the time of worship, 11 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, whatever. Let's just, let's just say, come now is the time of worship.
Interesting how Paul takes us to the first half of the chapter and he comforts us, encourages us, shows us how love, his love is revealed during the time that we did not deserve it, a time that we didn't seek for it, a time that we did not even know that there's such love that forgives. And we're all rejoicing about this love that not just reveals but his love reconciles and then all of a sudden in verse 12 he begins with this word which always makes you look for that other shoe to drop therefore so if god's love is so great if we've been reconciled it is the love of jesus that draws us therefore he says and starts talking about this word sin hard for us to understand it because sin is so pervasive it permeates our inner beings from the moment we're born that actually it kind of skews the way that we even see sin we've taken it to a place where we call lies white lies it's taken to a place where sometimes sin may be allowed for the greater good Peter had a hard time dealing with this idea of sin himself. If we jumped into the conversation where Jesus asks him, do you love me? And he keeps giving the wrong answer. 
We go back to the place where Peter came forward. He said, listen, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? Should I do it seven times? Because to him, sin was quite a relative by the law. I'm going to forgive you as many times as I'm required. The last time, probably be the toughest time because I've had enough. And then Jesus says, no, you must forgive without limits. Seventy times seven. He did not get that. Got to love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. You got to forgive your neighbor. But, but his sin against me is egregious. It's, it's deep. And so it's relative depending on who commits that sin against you and how hurt you are by that sin. But when you come to God, oh Lord have mercy on me a sinner. I'm so quickly ready to ask his forgiveness for my failures. But then when my my brother comes to me, I will take him by the throat, right? Because he owes me only 100 denarii, and he owes it to me. So sin is like cancer. But in order to be strengthened to understand that sin and what it has done to us, let's remember since therefore we've been justified by His blood. Much more. I hope you understood that you want to circle every time you see that much more. Because it's going to come in. Much more. Because God works much more than we can ask or think. Much more we shall be saved. Verse 9. From the wrath of God. We were enemies. And He reconciled us. More than that. Verse 11. We rejoice in God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Whom we have now received reconciliation. So we see that God's love regenerates. It does not just paint over the old house. It tears it down and rebuilds something brand new. That's what His love does through its power. And in the relationship, we saw that God's love reconciles. He draws you in, embraces you, gives you that ring of inheritance, puts a coat on you, grace and love, puts shoes on your feet, all of this like the prodigal. God's love reconciles. Verse 11, that's the one that prepares us to understand exactly what's going to happen in the following verses in dealing with sin. Because as Paul just said, Brother Paul, not Apostle Paul, uh, this message about sin seems to be daunting because we all have this burden somewhere in the back of our head. We know we're guilty. How can you preach a Sunday morning service and leave the people with that burden for the whole week? Well, maybe that's good for some of us. But to understand that sin, we are reminded by Paul, listen, even though you are such egregious sinners, you've been reconciled. You've been forgiven. Don't forget that. Because that will help you love your neighbor. Not for what he has done or done against you, but how much Christ has done in you. God's love reconciles. God's love redeems. More than that, we also rejoice in God. What does that mean to rejoice in God? We know how to be happy in circumstances, in good news, in a new page in our lives. We know how to rejoice. But then we learn in Scripture that happiness and joy are two different things. This joy that comes from the Lord is able to pierce any sad news. This joy is not rooted in things or circumstances. He says, we rejoice in God. A very, very rare phrase. What makes us rejoice in God? Well, as we see in this text, you don't keep your eyes on the sin. You don't keep your eyes on the flesh. You keep your eyes on the Lord. So now we keep our eyes on God. And who God is, that brings joy. For we are passing, and, and we as humans, we change our mind, we're frail, and we're finicky. 
But God is the same, and His loving attributes, His holiness, all of His attributes, they do not change. He says, listen, through all this, we've been reconciled, we've been redeemed, there's sin coming about that we look at, we, we see that God's love redeems. And there's joy in that. That redemption is actually that relationship of the shepherd that loves that one sheep so much that leaves all that is a treasure for him to find that one sheep and seeks it until he finds it. That redemption is ongoing. It's not, you're saved, here's your number, sit down, I'll get to you when I finish with the others. This redemption is refreshing, energizing. It is this stream of water, of living water. So we rejoice. What, what exactly do we rejoice in? Well, we can easily see in Scripture that we could, we must rejoice in God's wisdom. And all these pertain to His salvation for us. We rejoice in how wise God is. He's looking at an impossible situation. And yet in his wisdom, he's able to break through in a way that the world never thought possible. Not even angels could imagine what God will do to redeem humanity. Romans 11.13 says, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. It's not talking about our knowing God, but God's knowledge. That depth that we could never and will never comprehend. It's working constantly from all imaginable corners of the circumstance. That depth driven by His love and the riches which now are made available to you. And that's His wisdom. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgment. And how inscrutable. Nothing wrong with them. Never failing. You can't really understand them. Are His ways. We can marvel. Be amazed. And this wisdom that is able to save the powerless. That's us. The useless. The sinful and the ungodly. The sinful enemies. God is taking this impossible situation in His wisdom. We are to rejoice. Because that wisdom in this relationship is ongoing. Therefore, all things work together for good. For those who love God. And are all according to His purpose. That's His wisdom. All His wisdom, you know, whenever... Whenever I work on cars or anything like that, it so happens that while I'm trying to fix something that seems to be mundane and regular maintenance, I break something that's much more costly. <laughs> like trying to change brakes and stripping the bolt. I'm always afraid of that. I'm just going to do something very easy, but I know somewhere, somehow, that that bolt and the rust, and while I'm trying to take it off, I'll make a bigger mess. Then I, I started with. But I'm thinking the back of my mind. I know Paul has a way to fix this. And if he doesn't, I'm going to call Web. And he's got to have something in that garage. <laughs> There's got to be some tool that I've never heard of. And even if they don't, my mechanic has got the tools and the knowledge. And there's ways to get rid of that bolt that was strict. There's things I don't know. On, on a small level, we think, you know what? And then you think of doctors that way, right? And then when a doctor says, we don't know, you throw up your hands and who does? God. Amen. Times that we rely on other people's wisdom and that kind of gives us kind of a, a peace, right? But we limit ourselves to the things that are seen. In this case, we rejoice in God's wisdom. Unsearchable and the depths of it that is able to redeem a sinful humanity. How can God save sinners without ignoring or otherwise condoning their own sin? 
How can God save those who are filthy without getting himself dirty? How can God be both just and the justifier of the ungodly, as Paul says? The answer is, through the sinless life of Jesus, the Lamb. We rejoice in that. We also rejoice in God's grace. What do enemies deserve, after all? Justice and judgment. Destruction. However, God did not treat us that way. He saved us in that grace. The sacrifice of Jesus. We rejoice in that grace. We rejoice in God's power. That He's able to do that. Hold the universe in His hands. And yet, see your life. Intricately. And love you just as you are. Genesis 3 15. God's power revealed on the cross and prophesied from the beginning of our history. He's able to work through our history to bring it to a culmination of that cross. Now I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The cross, the sacrifice, the death and the victory, all within that verse. In the beginning of history, God's power preordained his salvation. We rejoice in his power, we rejoice in his love. Think of all the attributes. God is holy, omnipotent, all-knowing. But the one that we, we learn about his love, we learn it only through the cross. His love is shown to each one of us in the death of his son. We understand how much God has loved us. So, sadly, when we ask God for a sign that he truly loves us, we are insulting him. Because the greatest sign of his love for us is the cross. And lastly, we rejoice in God's, what we call in theology, immutability. The fact that he does not change. He is immutable. The same yesterday, today, and forever in his love, justice, grace, holiness. He will not waver in his love for you. He will not change his mind about you tomorrow because you sin tonight. Because of this immutability and unchanging character of his deity, his love, his grace, his wisdom will always remain the same. So if you understand this, Paul said, you also have to understand our enemy. Therefore, verse 12, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and when that happened, death through sin. And it didn't stop there. Death spread to all men. Why? Because all have sinned. And here's one of the problems that we have. Many people do not think that they have sinned. Or have sinned enough to deserve judgment. Actually, the idea of understanding our sinfulness is one of the most important in the message we give people when we give them the gospel. At times, we present the gospel as if we can better somebody's life by giving them a better life without them understanding that they're in desperate need of salvation. We think we're exchanging their retirement plan from A to B by accepting Jesus. Be happy now. Without them understanding how sinful and horrid they are. People don't know that God, as Scripture says, is angry every day with the wicked. We could begin with, for God so loved the world, and then somebody said, well, I've never really killed anybody. 
I'll take this off, sure, I'll add to the plan of my, my retirement, this religion thing. They don't understand that God is angry with the wicked daily. Because of sin. However, the blessing of the fulfilled grace from God to you is that when you believe in Jesus, and you accept Him in your life as your Savior and Lord, God forgives you all of your sin. Past, present, and future. Acts 22.16 You see that when we're born again, the blood of Christ cleanses us of all sins as Ananias spoke to Peter, Paul. And he said this, Now why do you delay talking with Paul? He was blinded, Ananias came, prayed over him, now he could see. And, and, and Ananias said, Listen, you've got to get up and be baptized. Wash away your sins, call him on his name, to make a little clarification. There's a difference between Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins. We know and we believe, based on the other scripture, that baptism does not save. The way this verse should be read is this way. Get up and be baptized. And wash away your sins by calling on His name. Accepting the Lord in your life, Paul, calling upon Jesus. Why are you calling for it? Calling to be saved because you understand your, your situation, your sin. You're calling upon His name. He saves you and then you baptize. It's the scriptural teaching of being repentant and obedient. Repentant for salvation and obedient in being baptized. It's Jesus that gives us that salvation. From these sins, however, over sin, that's the root, that's the problem. Not just the individual, but the reason why we sin or have sins is because we're born sin. Revelation 1.5 says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, that's Jesus, he is the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and release us from our sins. How? By His blood. We're saved by Jesus, by His blood. We're released from that curse at the point of new birth. Now, this does not mean that our problem in fight with sin is over. There are churches and denominations and false religions one is called the holiness movement. They believe that once you become a Christian, you will never sin again. You can have mistakes, but the mistake is not a sin. There's actually a delineation right there. Well, John says different, 1 John 1, 8. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say we have no sin. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And His Word is not in us. So we can make a comparison, connection between Word and Truth. His Word and Truth is in us. We have to realize that we, we do sin. <coughs> what are we doing to sin? It's a curse. Later on we'll see in Paul's struggle in chapter 6 saying, Listen, the things I don't want to do, I do things I want to do, I don't do, a wretched man that I am. I think this is why we need this, these verses, this, this, this leaning into this text to understand the problem of sin and how to deal with it. For if we're more aware of our sinful nature and our tendency to sin because of our sinful nature, we would definitely treat people differently. Because it's only when I think I'm perfect I'm going to judge you for wronging me. Sin has been our eternal enemy since the beginning of time. Back to Genesis chapter 4. 
So, Eve was deceived. Adam chose to be disobedient and take the fruit. And from there, the children followed. Cain killed Abel. And God comes to Cain and he says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? In other words, listen, uh, you brought a sacrifice of vegetables and the fruit of the earth. Do what your brother did, as he learned from his parents. Uh, bring a sacrifice of a lamb. Blood must be shed for that sin. And God says, listen, you made a mistake. I get it. Stop it. Do the right thing. He says this. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, here it is. Sin is crouching at the door. That's the idea of maybe a tiger or a lion. Um, all crouch and easily moving towards its prey. Just waiting to pounce. That's sin. Waiting for you to receive it and act upon it. Sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. How do we do that? That's what we want to learn. Now, not only is it the sin that's within us, we have three enemies. Our sin, the world, and Satan. And they're all trying to do one thing, destroy a man's life, or a woman's life in that matter. But Christ comes along. And that's why we read, for you are more than conquerors in these things. We are to subdue it and defeat it. And look what the devil does, First Peter 5, 8. He tells him, Peter says, listen, you've got to be aware. Be sober. Don't waste your time. Be aware. Keep your head on a swivel. As if you grew up in a big city like I did in Chicago, from the age of 12, I knew how to have my head constantly watching who's following me. It happened many times as a child. You're always aware. And later on, you always, people are not aware, but when you're driving, you, you, sometimes that car made two many turns in the same direction we did. You're always aware of that possibility. There's not to be uh, uh, schizo or constantly afraid. But he says, listen, in your spiritual walk, in your relationships. Be sober, be aware. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion. So you've got sin that's crouching, aiming at you. You've got Satan that's following and, and, and just walking around and, and waiting to, to have that opportunity, seeking someone to devour. How many of you have sinned yesterday? And if you say you didn't, you're sinning right now. <laughs> <clears throat> How many of you sinned this morning? <laughs> we give up. <laughs> what do we do? Well, this battle that we must be aware and be engaged in, in practical, scriptural steps. It's not going to bring us to a place where we will be sinless, but we will sin less and less. 1 John 2, 1. Two things that we want to learn how to do. To sin less, and the second thing is, what do you do after you sin? Satan likes to play both sides. He tempts you, he engages you, and then he just stabs you. And after he did that, then he points a finger at you and says, Nah, God's going to be so far away from you, you're useless now. Basically, he wants to kick you on the sidelines. Push you in the corner. Yes, I'll be That was Siri. <laughs> Satan wants to bring you to a place where you're useless by pushing you into a corner and shutting your mouth in your testimony. That's right. Wounded. Defeated. 
So how do we live our life to sit less in what we do after we sin? 1 John 2, 1 says, My children, I'm writing to you these things to you that you may not sin. So there's things written in Scripture leading us to the possibility that we will not sin. There's such peace when you have a guilt-free conscience. You know, one of the tactics for detectives after they arrested someone that they know they're guilty. And you learn this all the way from Dostoevsky, crime and punishment. The weight of their guilt of what the criminal has done is heavier than his desire to get away with it. And the biggest push of a detective in dealing with a criminal is Say what you did right now, and you can relieve yourself of that guilt. And many times they do. That's built within us. My children, these things are written, obviously, the epistle of John, but including scripture as a whole, because John is writing, but it's the Holy Spirit writing, right? These things are written that you will not sin. Now, Second part of that verse is our second our second lesson. If anyone sins, wait a minute, hold on a second. You just told me that if I pay attention here, I'm not going to sin, right? I got all the back. And then John says, "Listen, God knows you, and if anyone sins, okay, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous." And other texts show us that that is, we saw this last week, that Jesus lives forever to be our mediator. Here it is. He's an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is that word again, propitiation, the substitute, the full payment that is complete for our sins. So he takes his propitiated blood, blood and he replaces our sin on the altar, and God is satisfied. And not for ours only, but also for the for those of the whole world. Well, that last phrase, I'm not going to get into it. Just to, We'll get some other text. However, it doesn't mean that when Jesus died, the whole world is saved. Right? What that means is his death is sufficient to have saved the whole world. However, it's efficient only for the call. It's efficient for those who repent. It's efficient for those who call on his name. Right? <coughs> now, we've been down this road before. We have a few more minutes. And I want to open the door in dealing with. We call this. How to deal with spiritual ISDs. Now, Nan's son in law is a top notch staff sergeant commander of her whole battalion, but he used to be an IED, EOD mm -hmm. soldier. What does that mean? IEDs. Improved explosive devices. Okay? Improved. Those are the bombs that the terrorists would put on the side of the road, cover them up with sand and rocks, maybe a broken car that's hiding all the uh, explosives that you don't know you go by, and all of a sudden, boom, it's over. That's an IED. What we call this? improve spiritual or sinful devices. Improve sinful devices. Because you think that's when you least expect it, you're tempted, and all of a sudden, you fall on your face. But if you step back a little bit, we recognize that every single sin that you committed, you made a choice. You did not sin just by sneezing. 
there was a thought process going on in there. And you, you, when you were just about to choose, the Holy Spirit kind of tapped you ever so lightly, and you, and you still did it. Whatever that is. How do we deal with these ISDs, rude, sinful devices? Well, let's touch base with the first principle that we talk about what it is, how sin works, how sinless, the first part, and the second part, what do you do after you sin? So we call this first part sins are being stages. Like a bomb arms itself. You've seen the movies where don't shake it, don't move it, don't touch it, and the bomb just goes off and there's a countdown timer. There's a, a procedure to it, and James shows us what that is. What are sins? Army stages. And we'll just do the first stage for this morning. For at least you would be aware when you come across it. Remember, sin is crouching, and Satan is. Probably. What do you do? Well, the wisdom of God from His Word is available to you much more stronger than the wisdom of the enemy. So, sins are these stages. The first stage of sin is, and you know it, temptation. We know that temptation is not sin itself, even though the enemy will lie to you. Satan will lie. Say, listen, you've already been tempted, might as well finish it. We've heard people say, listen, if by looking at a young lady, I've already committed adultery in my mind, why not finish the job and at least sleep with her and I've got the whole package? Satan would want to use that kind of thinking in every single battle that you're dealing with, whether it's anger, wrath, coveting. James chapter 1, 14. So the first stage is temptation. Uh, temptation includes two things. Okay? Let's read. But each one is tempted. So that's what we're looking at. How? When he is carried away, there's a mindset of giving up that soberness. Remember, be sober and watchful. There's a place where we allow our mind to wander away and thinking on what if and then what. Carried away and enticed by his own lust. Two things. He's carried away and in that place of being taken away from what is right, and in this case, carried away from what? For if we keep the word of God, your word is the light unto my lamp, or your word I hold in my heart that I may not sin, sin against you. So I'm being carried away from the truth, being carried away from the word of God, being carried away from the fellowship, being carried away from being held accountable. Carried away and enticed. Now, enticing is what happens when the weeds grab thicker root. I don't know. In my old age, whatever that is, relatively speaking, I pay more attention to weeds in my yard. And I hate weeds. And I pluck them out with pleasure. But they keep coming back. I found out that if I see a very tender uh, uh, leaf coming up from the wheat, if I pay attention to it, that moment I see it and pull it out, comes out so easily. <laughs> but I find out that if the lawn is watered, and then I go pluck it out, it comes out even easier. <laughs> but if I wait week after week, and I don't pay attention, well, I do see it, but I walk away from it, it it begins to have deeper root and it takes a lot more work to pull out that weed. The water is the word. And the more I water my life with the word of God, the easier it is to pull out those weeds 
And the quicker I deal with those weeds, the easier. You say it takes 30 days to get rid of a bad habit. How many of you tried that? How many of you lasted 30 days fighting whatever that bad habit was? Because these habits become addictive. And sin is addictive. And the more it gets of what it wants, the stronger it is. Two stages. Carried away and enticed by his own lust. Well, the, this, his own lust part is the sin that lives within us. So it's kind of you're, you're scraping and you're trying to awaken what's already there and giving it more strength. And we understand this. We're talking about desire and we're talking about enticement. We understand this by looking at David. And it kind of breaks my heart. Doesn't it break yours? Of all the wonderful things David has done, the fact that he was a man after God's own heart, and by the way, he was a man after God's own heart based on the fact that he had a heart that was repentant. Repentant. The one thing we remember a lot about David is that night. That night on the roof. That night with that ship. 2 Samuel 11, verse 2. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. When evening came, David should have been sleeping in bed. And when evening came, David should have been meditating on God's word, but he got carried away. Before temptation ever smacks you right in your mind, and he seems to be so sweet. One of my sons is changing jobs. The job that he had was beginning to be very stressful on him. And you've all been there. You work at the job, and it's painful, and you can't wait to find a different job. And while you're looking for a different job, you're thinking, oh man, when I get that job, I'm going to beat them and drop them where they stand. And I'm going to make them feel the pain that I've been feeling. And you go through all that. And then you get the job and your heart's already gone. You still got to stay here two weeks and you're thinking of ways to make them feel the way you did. That's temptation. That's flesh wanting to take over to, to, to have a bad testimony. You think it may be a very small thing, but it's, it's our sin. Being carried away in that mindset of what we would do to gain justice for our own selves. In David's case, he's on the roof being carried away. And here it is. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. The wise thing would have been to turn around and go inside and talk to God. But that moment was already too late. Carried away where he should not be, allowing himself to see what he should not see, he was enticed. And the woman was very beautiful. We have two things here desire lust and enticement, the opportunity and encouragement to satisfy the desire. And then we think for reasons why we should. Like, you've been in a situation where you wanted to buy something that you knew you didn't need or you shouldn't have bought or you think of reasons why you should get it. And you begin to find all these arguments of why it should be done. That's that enticement. And you spend time walking on that roof and keep looking over and saying, man, that sure looks good. If I had that house, if I had that car, if I had that job, if I had that church, whatever it may be, we spend time in this, in this rooftop of enticement. While temptation is working. Verse 3 of 2 Samuel 11 says, so David, David sent and inquired about the woman. The desire took place on the roof. 
the enticement now begins to be developed as he takes the next steps, which is he sent and inquired about the woman. Why? Why do you need to know anything about the woman? And one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Alien, the wife? Whoa. But by that moment, David was already blind. There is a moment in that temptation in your life when you allow yourself to become blinded by anger, by self-pity, by lust, whatever it may be. Because you spend too much time on the roof. And that's the beginning of the end. David sent an inquiry. We have a, um, I wish I would have put this up, but I quite didn't. There is a formula, and that's the first formula you need to remember, which will save you a lot of head. Temptation equals desire plus opportunity. If you knock out any one of those two things, in five minutes as you walk away from that temptation, you're like, oh, Lord, this feels so good. I didn't fall. Desire and opportunity. Maybe desire, sin crouching and Satan prowling. Desire, you get smacked in the face with it because you're a human. But the opportunity, you can knock out. Just like a small boy is tempted to steal some cookies. When he wants or desires them, then he has the occasion or the opportunity to take them. Mom is not home. Temptation becomes stronger if he wants them badly. And he has a good chance of taking them when nobody can see. Now, at any stage of this development of sin, of this arcing stage of this sin, Actual sin has not been committed. You're wrestling. Not with flesh and blood, but you're wrestling. You haven't sinned yet. You're wrestling with the desire and you're thinking about the opportunity, but, but the two have not been combined as, as the components in a bond. Keep them apart. Jesus himself was tempted to give without sin. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are. Could you imagine Jesus being tempted by some of the things we're tempted by? We dare not think about that, do we? But the Bible says Jesus was tempted, yet he did not sin. There is a way. Remember the verse? But with every temptation, God has provided a way out that you may endure. Hebrews 2.18. Hebrews 2.18. For since himself was tempted in that which he has suffered. Think about it this way. When you're tempted, you either choose to suffer or sin. Get it? You choose to suffer in crucifying the self. In saying no, in stepping off that roof, taking away the opportunity, getting on your knees and back in the word and not saying the words, not looking, not calling, not deciding, not closing the door, not telling somebody you'll never talk to them again. You crucify the self. He's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. So keep an eye out for this first stage of arm called temptation. We'll talk more about this next time. And we we'll learn of simple ways. And you'll see that each one leads back to the Word of God. Each one leads back to prayer. 
but be sober. Be aware. The sin is crouching. And Satan is like the roaring lion. Always looking for that seed rock that ran off by itself. For that antelope that is alone. We need each other. And we need to be in the fellowship so close that we can call each other to the Word of God. Because if we just meet on Sundays and talk a little bit on Wednesdays, but we're not into each other's lives. Say, brother, you're walking on the roof. Get off that roof. Because once you're on the roof, you can't but look. And then it's over. Pick that weed. He talked to Dan about picking the weeds, and then he's a good example for me. And I take my time and enjoy pulling them out because I like seeing a green field of grass, green lawn, growth and life. That's what God wants to see in our lives. However, if you do sin, you have an end. You've got Jesus on your side. Not just to cover your sin, but to cleanse you and strengthen you that you would not sin again. Forgive me, Father, for my weakness, my sin. Give me the strength that I will be the first student of your word. Lord, that I will squash any opportunity that I will crucify the flesh. That Jesus may get the glory as we mirror his life in ours. Father, the sin that has come into the world it has been defeated on the cross. Let that, Father, be in our lives a moment of glory to you, a challenge that we would humble ourselves before you, walking in meekness and humility before our brothers and sisters, our neighbor, that we would not point fingers, but that we would kneel asking forgiveness, being in the Word and not sinning. Forgive our nation, for blood is flowing in the streets from the sin of our nation. Let your church, Father, let us judge ourselves before you so that we would not be judged. Bring repentance to our lives in this nation. In the name of Jesus Christ.
Lord, you have rescued us from sin. You've rescued us from the penalty of sin. Lord, you've given us your Holy Spirit to fight against the desires and temptations of our lives. Father, help us to not be a as Pastor Father, but Lord, to be in our closet with you, in prayer, fellowship with you, Lord, to fight all those temptations and those desires. Father, as we go into this week now, we pray that you would give us strength for the battle. Father, we pray that you would give us grace to serve you and to honor you. Glory to yourself through all that we say to you throughout this week. Lord, as we uh, have lunch time now um, afterwards, Father, we thank you for the, the meal that has been provided. Father, we pray that you bless those who have provided it. We pray, Lord, that you would bless those fruits for our bodies as we eat. We thank you for all this, Lord. We love you. For it's in your sense, we pray. Amen. Amen.